I decided to use the the nicer caps and and when I say the nicer caps you know this is what my junk box looks like right this is what I usually pick out of but not this time this time I'm using some really high quality caps the kind that you could get you know on DigiKey or Mauser so guys it is making a difference <laughs> I hate to admit it but using higher quality capacitors it's unbelievable now I'll probably put it in the case and the thing will go crazy so it'll give me something to do but uh, so welcome to part two of our VFO uh, discovery video series and uh, in this uh, second session we're going to build another VFO from scratch and uh, I think the the goal of this video is to build a VFO that covers oh maybe 20 or 30 kilohertz uh, of tuning on the front and uh, has a single control that I'm going to call compensation and when you turn it to the right it compensates up in frequency when you turn it to the left it compensates down in frequency uh, some other goals with this VFO how about no variable capacitors uh, we're only going to use varactors in this VFO now the first one that we build will be capacitors and uh, it'll be a standard VFO using uh, uh, standard components and then we will try to convert it over to two varactors and see how successful we can be. Now uh, what I have on the table here represents typical VFO parts and you can group them into three different sections. Kind of the middle section I'm going to call the zero uh, pile. These are things that generally if they're built correctly do not have a positive or a negative temperature coefficient. That means they don't change uh, their, their value up or down over temperature. Now, of course, that's impossible in the real world, but generally if capacitors are built well and they have uh, you know, a good quality ceramic, uh, good quality metal, uh, they can be made to be uh, virtually zero uh, coefficient. Also, the NP0, or I call them NPO type capacitors, and the C0G type capacitors, they're not supposed to change over temperature. So they're in the middle here. Uh, to the left, we have our negative coefficient parts, and these are specially built capacitors that will change so many parts per million as they warm up, they go down in value. They have a negative temperature coefficient. Over here on this side, we have things that tend to increase in value with temperature. Now, some capacitors do that. Uh, picking through some silver dip mica caps that I had in my junk box, I found some that absolutely had a positive temperature coefficient. They increased value with temperature. Pretty rare to find one, though. Uh, it's common for most ferrite-tuned slug coils to have a positive frequency coefficient. That means they're going to go up in value and your frequency on your VFO is going to go down, 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 down. Most coils exhibit that type of uh, behavior. Uh, the famous command set transmitter, World War II, used slug tuning in its VFO and you might have found this little dog bone capacitor connected up there. This dog bone was a temperature compensation, negative temperature coefficient device that made sure that that command set, ARC-5, used in the B-17 bomber, would remain somewhat on frequency as we went up in altitude to very cold temperatures. Also, varactor diodes. A lot of varactor diodes tend to seem to have a positive temperature coefficient. That is, they tend to go up in value with temperature. So again, the varactor diode circuit is going to 
your VFO is going to go down, down, down in frequency. Welcome to part two of the VFO series. So let's let's talk a little bit about uh, variable capacitors as part of this VFO uh, discussion. First of all, the uh, the classic ganged capacitor. You guys are all familiar familiar with these. The gain capacitor has three separate stators and a common rotor that is grounded to the frame. And you know, schematic symbol, something like this. You might also be familiar with the butterfly capacitor. And you can see this is a butterfly capacitor. It's kind of hard to see, but it does kind of look like a butterfly in there. And this is a, uh, a type of capacitor that has a split stator and the rotor is common. Okay. Another version of that is the split stator capacitor. And in, uh, in this guy here, as you can see, you have two different stators, one here and one here. And the rotor has opposing 180 degree out of phase veins. Okay, so that's another form of the uh, of the butterfly really. It's a split stator capacitor. Now the one that I'm most interested in for this particular video is called the differential split stator. It can also be done with a rotated rotor. In other words, if we were to take this capacitor here, what would happen is, as this one was letting off capacity, this one would be adding capacity. So that we could make this into a differential capacitor. So the best way to think of a differential capacitor is as one is increasing, the other is decreasing. And uh, we can argue about these symbols. There's all kinds of symbols all around the world. Engineers deal with other symbols and they all kind of understand what's going on. It's not a big deal just because a symbol's drawn differently. So I, I built one. I built a differential capacitor so you could see it more easily. Now, as you can see, as I turn it, this guy's getting more capacity as this guy gets less. So this is a differential capacitor. Why is that important for a VFO discussion? It's important because what we could do is on this stator, we could put a NP, NP0, NPO <laughs> capacitor, or a positive coefficient capacitor that increases in value with temperature. And on this particular stator we could put a negative coefficient capacitor. And both of them would be in parallel. So no matter what we do here, it's the same capacitance. But as we change this capacitor, it gives it more negative or more positive depending on how we rotate it. It's a quick way to compensate a VFO using a differential capacitor. One control, you just put your positive on this one and your negative on this one and you dial it in. So that's an easy way to compensate a VFO. The thing is, those capacitors are impossible to find, but I thought it would be worth a discussion anyway. So we'll see if we can do it with two separate variable capacitors. One variable capacitor that has a positive coefficient capacitor on it and one variable capacitor that has a negative temperature compensation capacitor on it. And then we'll dial it in kind of by hand and see if we can compensate the oscillator. Later on we might get fancy and do it with varactors as the tuned circuit we still would be using the positive and negative coefficient capacitors, but in this case we would use varactors to bring them in.
no, that's very crude using a heat gun. We should be doing this in a controlled oven. But what is this telling you about this VFO? The frequency is going down. What does this tell you? It tells you that it needs to be corrected with a negative temperature coefficient capacitor. So to build a VFO where we specifically are going to be looking at compensation, we have to start with the basic bones of the VFO and uh, that starts with a nice heavy die cast box. Um, you want to use uh, variable capacitors that are uh, very stable with uh, ceramic and preferably uh, brass and uh, nickel plated or silver plated type stuff rather than aluminum. And I've got a chunk of mini ductor here I'm going to use as the main coil. Um, also we're going to do compensation so I've got a pair of trimmers here one is going to be for the positive compensation and the other is going to be for the negative compensation. So we'll be using that in this experiment. When I, uh, when I am building up a VFO, I typically build it up as a breadboard on the bench, get everything all worked out, you know, make sure that the feedback's correct on the oscillator, make sure the whole thing's working correctly, make a few adjustments, and then, and only then, do I try to put it inside the case. Now, uh, the circuit I'm using is uh, pretty straightforward. It's, uh, I've decided to keep it super simple. Just something I quickly drew up here based on things I've seen on the internet and, and experience. Two FETs. Both of them have the added emitter bias and are using chokes in the source. So that's it, just two stages. Um, I'm getting out about 600 millivolts RMS, which is plenty for our testing. I'm using an LM140 5 volt regulator just on the oscillator. The buffer is running on the full 12 volts. So I did use the C0G class 1 type capacitors, the really nice ones, and not capacitors from my junk box, not silver micas, but the uh, uh, the NPOs, or as you guys call it, the NP0s, uh, the modern versions, uh, multi-layer uh, uh, ceramic capacitors. They're uh, very popular today. Now we're getting a very stable sine wave. Looks good. Now, we're trying to show compensation. So this thing should be drifting like crazy, and then we're going to try to compensate it and stop the drift. But I've got a problem. Yeah, the problem is it's completely stable. It doesn't know what to do. And it's just sitting here on the table. Now, I'd like to say this was my magnificent engineering, but it's not. The thing is just happy right now. So we're going to have to dirty it up in order to even make this video. So this doesn't even seem fair, does it? That you just build something willy-nilly and uh, just by using these nice parts, you know, the really high-quality capacitors instead of the silver micas and the random ceramic discs that I usually use in circuits, I decided to use the, the nicer caps. And, and when I say the nicer caps, you know, this is what my junk box looks like, right? This is what I usually pick out of. But not this time. This time I'm using some really high quality caps, the kind that you could get, you know, on DigiKey or Mauser. So Guys, it is making a difference. <laughs> I hate to admit it, but using higher quality capacitors it's unbelievable. Now, I'll probably put it in the case and the thing will go crazy, so it'll give me something to do, but uh, yeah. <laughs> Murphy's Law, I guess.
So just to expose my ignorance on the capacitor subject, I'll present a short discussion of uh, cap behavior. In general, those uh, purple silver tip micas are positive temperature coefficient, meaning they vary from NP NP0, or NPO as I call it, to slightly more capacitance in general when you heat them up. They're a good target for positive temp correction, uh, meaning the uh, frequency uh, is going up in your VFO and you want to stop it uh, and make it uh, go down in frequency, you'd put one of those positive temp coefficient caps in and now your frequency would go lower. Uh, you can still get quite a few negative coefficient caps, uh, N750s, N2200s, and so on. Most of these are ceramic types and uh, you can use them to correct an oscillator that's going down in frequency. You want to stop that and make it go back up to a stable frequency. You could see how effective the C0G caps were with a good uh, air coil. The VFO is doing pretty well without any comp compensation at all. Uh, short term the frequency seems to go down a little bit. Long term it recovers and then goes a little bit above uh, the starting frequency. The entire excursion seemed to be less than 100 hertz over the 12 hours that I operated it and uh, basically the basement temperature varied about 10 degrees Fahrenheit or a little over 6 degrees Celsius. Um, so what about these C0G caps? How good are they? C0G are noted as being NP0 or NPO class 1 ceramic capacitors. Uh, they're not supposed to show a significant change in normal value over temp. That means they have a zero temperature coefficient. Uh, generally mica, polyester, and some ceramic uh, mixes give this NP0 characteristic. Uh, temp coefficient is expressed as parts per million per degree centigrade, or Celsius, ppm per degree C. That does not mean these caps are perfect. They will have a specification. The best on the uh, NP0s are plus or minus 30 parts per million. Uh, for the best ones. So what is parts per million? Uh, it's basically uh, one part per million is 0.0001%. So 10% would be 100,000 parts per million. Uh, let's have an example. Uh, we have a 470 puff C0G cap and we want to consider it uh, with a drift from 25C to 35C. So uh, we calculate that out with using our uh, plus or minus 30 parts per million, uh, or our 30 parts per million, and we get uh, 470e minus 12 times 30 parts per million times 10, that's the 10 degrees, divided by uh, 1 million, okay, and we end up with plus or minus 0.141 picofarads. Therefore, a 10 degrees C change in our 5 meg VFO would result in a cap value as high as uh, 47141 puff or as low as 469860 puff. So if we consider that same VFO with a 2 microhenry coil, we get uh, 5191.062 kilohertz. And our change uh, based on the tolerance would be plus and minus 776 hertz for that change from 25C to 35C, basically 77F to 95F. So that's a lot worse than what I'm seeing. So most of these caps do better than those extreme ratings. So a C0Gs are not actually NP0, but they're the best we can do with Digikey and Mauser type parts and the majority will beat this uh, 30 part per million tolerance. So you want to talk about class 2 capacitors. No, I don't want to talk about them because I don't think it's appropriate to use class 2 capacitors uh, which vary wildly and non-linearly, by the way, compared to the C0Gs and the MP0s. So, uh, we like that linear correction that we get with the class 1 capacitors. 
Class 1 means Class 1 dielectric, good quality dielectric. Class 2, the dielectric is not as good, therefore you get some nonlinearities in. Let's take a look inside, taking a look inside at the die-cast box. We have the main tuning capacitor here in front, the air coil over here. I mounted the board on the side with standoffs. There's a, uh, a filter feed-through and uh, the BNC output connector. Over here I have two capacitors that are going to be my compensation adjustment capacitors. Right now I just have one of those attached representing uh, that capacitance in the circuit. Once I put the compensation capacitors on each of them, one will have a positive and one will have a negative uh, coefficient, then we'll be able to dial it in to get perfect compensation. But it turns out this, uh, this darn oscillator is just very stable. Even inside the box it, uh, it remained fairly stable. I uh, saw it go down in frequency as, as hoped. Generally, uh, they go down, they have a positive coefficient that is governed mostly by the coil if you're using NP0, NPO type capacitors. Uh, that's what you'd like to see. You'd like to see it going down in frequency and then you just put a negative coefficient capacitor on there to compensate it. Uh, this guy did go south initially for the first hour and then it recovered, came back through zero and ended up 40 hertz high. So method one is fairly simple. We take the capacitor under test and attach it to the capacitance bridge. Now in your case you may have a nice capacitance meter, an LCR meter, or maybe your handheld multimeter has a good capacitor meter on it. I like my bridge because it's, uh, it's very accurate and uh, specific to uh, uh, to, to measuring all kinds of parameters on caps. Let's, uh, let's see if we've got it zeroed first of all. Okay, we do. And the scale, what's it reading? We're on the number three scale. It looks like it's just above 800 puff. And it's supposed to be an 820 puff capacitor. So, let's hit it with the heat gun and see what happens. Okay, we re-zero it. It looks like its value has definitely gone down. It's almost down to 750 puffs. So it went down in value. So it's definitely an N type capacitor. So let's take and take a look at the capacitor. It is an N2200. It's an N2200 capacitor. So that's one way to check if the capacitor is positive or negative coefficient is to check it with a capacitor meter of some kind and hit it with the heat gun and watch which direction it goes. So I, I have an uh, interesting way to try to test capacitors for their positive or negative coefficient. Uh, not using a capacitance meter or a bridge, which would be fairly crude, but uh, you know those are usually operating at a lower, lower frequency or at least the wrong frequency. Instead, I've actually got a couple of binding posts attached directly to the tuned circuit, and I brought those up through two short wires through uh, a couple of layers of cardboard, and I'm going to heat the capacitors with the heat gun and just see which direction they go and uh, see how they react so that we can select a couple of capacitors. We, we want one that's a positive coefficient and one that's a negative coefficient. And we'll just keep our eye on the uh, counter and that way we can pick a couple of capacitors from our junk box and uh, figure out what we're doing kind of empirically instead of trying to calculate something out. Uh, because we're using uh, variable capacitors for our compensation uh, in a scheme that allows us to do um, independent uh, independent 
compensation of the negative and the positive, um, it doesn't really matter what the exact values are. It's just, uh, are we getting a good effect? And we'll dial it in, so to speak, once we get our two capacitors chosen. Okay, this video has gotten a little bit long and a little bit out of control, so we're going to have to uh, break off here. We'll continue with part three of our VFO Discovery Series.